I'm really looking forward to hearing from him, his ideas, his thoughts, his insights. So, Professor Lakotia ji, we are, we are welcoming you in virtual space today. But when times get better, we will have you here in person so that you can interact with our faculty members and students when you visit us in future. Thank you very much. The podium is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I welcome once again uh, all the distinguished scholars who joined online. And uh, the first and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor B.J. Rao, our Vice Chancellor. He is the one who suggested this topic as well as the speaker. And we are fortunate that, you know, um, Professor Lakotia uh, is readily agreed. And then uh, and we are excited to hear him as uh, Professor Vice Chancellor uh, said. So he is very straight and then uh, in sharing his original views. So that's where more uh, interesting uh, today. And uh, as as such, though he is, uh, if anybody has seen him, though he is a tall in nature, is one of the tall personality in scientific community in India. And uh, uh, we, especially this generation, one would like to see uh, his uh, research credentials, the way long back uh, is uh, how he has described the long non-coding RNAs, the importance of long non-coding RNAs and then its uh, functional significance way back in 1982. And now in, in 2022, we are all work, you know, like uh, going behind those long non-coding RNAs in, in order to decipher their uh, significance and function in cell and metabolism. So that is what his vision and his contributions. And uh, just to brief his uh, CV and then uh, uh, for the people who is not aware of uh, him. So, sir is the member for all the uh, three major academies like uh, FNA, Fellow of National Academy, National Academy of Sciences and FASC. And he has uh, two dozens of uh, distinct, uh, distinctions and uh, to name uh, one or two. And uh, sir is the um, uh, uh, DST Raman Fellow, uh, BHU uh, emeritus professor and then distinguished fellow, uh, professor for the lifetime and uh, so uh, serb distinguished fellow right now and as, as such sir is the faculty member for lecturer associate professor and professor dean all at all positions in department of zoology benares Hindu university and uh, uh, he has contributed more than uh, 100 publications uh, of uh, from, from his uh, laboratory sir is a pioneer in uh, uh, in cytogenetics and then he used uh, drosophila as a model system to to uh, describe the uh, to understand the chromosome organization and then replication and uh, and as i said so he is one of the first person i would say like uh, describing in function and uh, importance of long non coding non coding rnas in drosophila way back in 1982 and then he's still active in in, in scientific contribution and uh, and moreover as uh, just now uh, bc uh, professor vijay uh, rao garu mentioned and he is uh, very uh, active in sharing uh, his original views especially in the science education and uh, the how much we to take uh, the values of impact factor what is it and plagiarism and and goes on so not only by public talks he is uh, his, his writings are uh, appeared in major uh, newspapers as well as the uh, news items in the scientific journals as well so that is where uh, more interesting and then we would like to hear more about his views on the role of universities in nation building so thank you for accepting sir our request and then uh, uh, i would like you to continue thank you sir Okay, shall I share my slides? Yeah, you can share, sir. Start. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Uh, is it visible now? Bindu, you have to undo this uh, oh, yes. sharing, right? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I think uh, as, as soon as he starts, it will disappear, sir. Okay. okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. Anyway, right. we are closing it. 
Thanks. Uh, I, I thank uh, Professor B.J. Rao and uh, Dr. Reddy and their colleagues for asking me to uh, give a talk today on this very important topic, uh, which is, uh, as was stated, uh, the, on the occasion of uh, C.V. Raman's remarkable achievement, just to celebrate C.V. Raman, a, a self-made Nobel laureate. Uh, and just because of the relentless pursuit of knowledge, he got into this stage where he was standing uh, very proud uh, along with all of the Nobel laureates. You know, it's remarkable that Professor Raman didn't have a PhD degree perhaps and didn't have a, I mean, a formal PhD degree or, or a supervisor, but he still went on. And that's what indicates the importance of knowledge and importance of learning and the hard work that goes with it. What I plan to do in uh, this talk today is just to bring out some historical aspects and some things that what uh, teaching, education, and universities are expected to do and how we can achieve that. So I may not talk more about the policy issues, but more about the general philosophy of education learning, and I hope that will generate some interest in the process. Now, uh, see, when we talk of knowledge, we, we need to understand two things that uh, and under knowledge uh, comes curiosity and language. And, and you know, this is the remarkable feature of humans only, that we can wonder. Many animals can wonder, but then the humans have a remarkable ability to, ability to wonder at their ability to wonder. We, because we ask, how does our brain think? This is something that we believe is a unique feature of humans. And this was catalyzed, or this was responsible because the human species develops spoken and written languages, which enable mankind to transfer the new information and or new interpretation to others in not only contemporary, but future generations. And, and I think this is where lies the secret of all learning uh, at the lower level, higher level, universities, and so on, that we can store and compile the information over the years, over the generations, and thereby become richer and richer in the intellectual pursuits. And, and this new knowledge has been instrumental in progress of civilizations and nations. Everything that we see today is because of the new knowledge. And that's where today we talk of uh, knowledge economy, that nations that have good knowledge, source of knowledge are more prosperous, more leaders. Sir, sorry, and, and that's sorry, what sorry to disturb India you, should uh, aim for. Sir, your slides. Sir, are you? Yeah. Sir, not visible. And the slides are not visible. Uh, sorry, are you sure? coming? Are not Your visible. slides are not visible, sir. No. I'm sorry. Just wait a minute. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll say share the slides first, sir. Yeah, I did that. Now is it visible? Select the screen. Uh, is it visible now? No, no, sir. No, sir. Wait a minute. Uh, share, I did. And select you, the you screen. You have to select the folder. You have to, you select the entire screen. Okay, and, uh, yeah, share. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. And, uh, Can't share your screen, it tells me. Let me go back. Or can you quickly close and join again, sir? Okay, I think I, I will quick and join back again. Yeah, yes. yeah, I think that is better. Yeah. Professor Ranganagaru, Namaste. Namaskar, how are you, sir? Very good, very good. Good to see you yeah. after a long time, several years. Yes, yes, thank you, sir. <laughs> Where are you now, sir? Thank you, Center for Human Genetics. Okay, okay thank you. Now it is good sir, coming. Yeah, yeah. Sir, you are on unmute. Sir. Please unmute it, sir. Professor Akodia, yes, sir. Okay, is it uh, in my yes. slide visible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Can you you can put you in the... Screen, you... Yeah, I'll go to put yes. screen. Uh -huh. no, but... now? Yes, yes, perfect. Sir. You're all good. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry for this uh, disruption. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, this is what something that Siviraman had done. I want to repeat. But then 
what what we are importantly talking about is that the human's capacity to wonder at their own capacity is something remarkable. And this was possible because the human species developed a language. Language is present in many animals and plants are their chemical language, but then the human language is something different, much more articulate. And the fact that we could develop written language allowed it to be passed on from generation to generation. Because uh, while what, what we speak can disappear at some time, but what we write or what we engrave somewhere continues over generations. And this is what the accumulating knowledge has been instrumental in progress of civilizations, and so has been the country's progress. And, and, and this has been always recognized that knowledge is essential for progress of civilization and nation. This has been since the beginning of uh, our history, civilization, we knew, we knew that increasing knowledge is what is responsible for the way we live, the way uh, we make our life better and easier. And this is something I, I just quote from one of the great scholars, Father of Indology, uh, Abu Rehan uh, Al Baruni, who actually visited India in uh, about 1000 years ago. He was a great scholar. And in fact, he was greatly impressed with the ancient Indian knowledge. He learned Sanskrit, he taught Indian philosophy, Indian physics, and chemistry. And he wrote this beautiful book on travel to India. And, and somewhere he, he makes the statement, there's knowledge in general, which is pursued solely by man and which is pursued for the sake of knowledge itself. Because its acquisition is truly delightful and is unlike the pleasure desirable from other pursuits. For the good cannot be brought forth and evil cannot be avoided except by knowledge. And so knowledge has been the real thing whereby human civilizations have been progressing and we are where we are today. But then, if we can uh, share knowledge through written things over generations, do we need classrooms? One can read, one can, as, as many people think today, that everything's all over on the internet. Can't we read and can't we get educated? And, and so, do we need a classroom? Uh, in fact, uh, if we go in current uh, contemporary situation, during COVID pandemonium, we had most online classes. But I'm sure every student and teacher realizes that even though we could talk online, even though we could learn online, we could read many things, but what is classroom experience is classroom experience. And this is where it becomes important that we need classrooms because there's another important thing about knowledge is that knowledge is not a commodity that can be transferred from one brain to another. It's not that just you take a, like a material thing, transfer from one to another, because knowledge is something unique that teachers share their knowledge, but then they don't part with it. The knowledge increases, and that's important. That happens in a classroom or anywhere they learn that we increase the knowledge, and 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 this is what is important thing that good learning is not only inquiry based but also inquiry stimulating. That it it stimulates more inquiry so that one uh, has a greater thirst for more knowledge, more learning. Now, what is a university? What do we mean by university? There are various ways people have defined, but in general, what I think is. A university is the highest place of learning where students and teachers together participate for the advancement. And uh, I emphasize together, it's not just one way traffic, it's a two way traffic uh, the, for the advancement, acquisition, and communication of knowledge in a liberal spirit and thus prepare students for their chosen professions and other aspects of life. What we mean by liberal spirits here is that it's not just limited to one particular domain. It's a much wider domain where one learns in classroom, one learns outside classroom, and together, and even in classroom, one learns various subjects so that one can interact. You see, the name universities, because it encompasses much wider uh, uh, platform than a, a small uh, uh, learning place. And besides disseminating knowledge, universities also create new knowledge through research and consequently provide platforms for updated learning based on existing as well as new knowledge created through research. And this is where universities have a special place that they not only uh, disseminate knowledge, but they also create new knowledge for research. Now, I, I, I'll just take two examples, historical examples of academic institutions that have contributed immensely to India's growth and progress. One is the Banarsin University, where I happen to be serving for last almost nearly 50 years. And the other is uh, the Tata Institute of, the Institute of Science, often uh, till now known in, in Bangalore more as the Tata Institute. And the, but these were the far-sighted vision and selfless commitment 
which led to the origin of these institutions of higher learning. I'll just give a brief history about uh, the engineering school of science because I suspect many of them may not know how it came about. It was one of the uh, great industrialists, uh, Jamshedji Tata, who had great vision about India. And, and uh, more than 100 years ago, or more than 120 years ago, when he thought about things, uh, he, he created remarkable things. He created the first spinning mill, cotton mill in India. He created the first hydroelectric power station to supply electricity to Bombay. Then he created two, two institutions. One was the Taj Hotel, one of the premier hotels in the country, the first one to have all these facilities. And the second was what we now know as Indian sort of science. He'd been thinking about it. And as Charles would have it, he and Swami Vivekanand happened to travel together on a ship from uh, Tokyo to Chicago in uh, 1893. Of course, Swami Vivekanand was going there for, the, for his well-known uh, meeting in the, in, in the religious con conference. And uh, Tata was going for some business. And they happened to talk on, on the ship during this long interval. And that's what uh, put them together and ultimately resulted in what we now know as uh, the Indian Institute of Science. The Tata's dream was to create a research institute of science in India, which can provide the best of research, best of facilities to young Indians. And, and that's what it ultimately resulted in, this beautiful campus. Uh, a, a little more about this history, that uh, five years after they had uh, traveled together, to uh, Tata wrote this letter to Swami Vekaran, I trust you remember me as a fellow traveler on your voyage from Japan to Chicago. I very much recall at this moment your views on the growth of the ascetic spirit in India and the duty not of destroying but of delivering it into useful channels. I recall these ideas in connection with my scheme of research institute of science for India. Now, because this is what he had been dreaming about, of which you have doubtless heard or read, it seems to me that no better use can be made of the ascetic spirit then the establishment of the monasteries or residential halls. Now, mind it, monasteries he compares with residential halls for men dominated by the spirit, where they should live with ordinary decency and devote their lives to this cultivation of sciences, natural and humanistic. I am of opinion that if such a crusade in favor of an asceticism of this kind were undertaken by a competent leader, it would greatly help asceticism, science, and the good name of our common country. And now this is important. I know not who would make a more fitting general of such a campaign than Vivekananda. Do you think you would care to apply yourself to the mission of galvanizing into life our ancient traditions in this respect? And this letter was quickly followed by Vivekananda's response in, a, in his mag, uh, uh, magazine, Prabuddha, where he wrote this, a part of which reads like this, uh, uh, what he wrote back. And this was rather swift. We are not aware if any project at once so opportune and so far reaching in its beneficial effects was ever mooted in India and that of the postgraduate research university of Mr. Tata. The scheme grasped the vital point of weakness in our national well-being with its clearness of vision and tightness of, of grip, the masterliness of which is only equaled by the munificence of the gift which, uh, I'm sorry, which uh, it is assured to the public. Tata's scheme paved the path for placing into the hands of Indians in this knowledge of nature. And then he goes on later on. By some, the scheme is regarded as chimerical because of the immense amount of money required for it, to wit, about rupees 74 lakh. The best reply to this fear is many people thought, what get, can we get 74 lakh? And that's what Vivekan replies. If one man, and he not the richest in the in land, could find rupees 30 lakh, could not the whole country find the rest? It is ridiculous to think otherwise when the interest sought to be served is of the paramount importance. And this ultimately led to the uh, formation of Institute of Science. But there are still some problem. Parsi community didn't feel very happy. But why should Parsi community's money go in charity where others get benefited? And Jain Tata in his remarkable uh, national feeling responded with this. What advance a nation or community is not so much to prop its weakest and most helpless members as to lift up the best and most gifted so as to make them of the greatest service to the country. I prefer this constructive philanthropy, which seeks to educate and develop the facilities of the best of our young men. And if this is to be done, 
what I ask my fellow Parsis is, what difference is it to them, whether it is exclusively to their benefit or open to all? If able professors and specialists are to be obtained, the cost will be the same, but it is only a few Parsis alone that attend their lectures, or young men of all communities. The Parsis cannot supply more than a few students for each postgraduate class, and it will be foolish to have costly professors to lecture to only two or three Parsis, with the exclusion of hundreds who are anxious to benefit. Now, this is remarkable. And immediately, the Hindu wrote uh, an editorial where it said, Mother India has long been crying for a man among her children, and in Mr. Tata, she has found the son of her heart. Now, this really reflects the uh, ethos of Tata that the Indian social science was built. And then we come to the next uh, remarkable thing, Banarsin University, with Madan Mawli thought. And in 1905, he proposed a prospectus of a Hindu university. And the objective was, we'll seek not merely to turn out men as engineers, scientists, doctors, merchants, theologists, but also as men of high character, probity, and honor, whose conduct through life would show that they bear the hallmark of a great university. Now, this is something that BHU has been built with, and, 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 and as uh, Malviji laid the foundation, it was an entirely national university because from kings to beggars, everybody contributed across the country. And this university uh, got going, and its vision for 20 years from 1920 to 1940 to the vice chancellor, this university made remarkable progress, and obviously it has contributed enormously to the nation's progress. Now, Sir Radha Krishnan, he was the vice chancellor of BHU after Malviji uh, completed his term in 1940, and he, he was very keen that Radha Krishnan should be the vice chancellor. And you know, it's something very interesting. When Radha Krishnan was made vice chancellor, he held three positions simultaneously Vice Chancellor of BHU, Professor of English at Calcutta, and Professor of Philosophy at Oxford. And he carried on all three. And it written enormous about education and whatnot. So uh, I just quote some of his statements that the purpose of education is to help the student to earn a living. That's first, that they, they become capable of earning and supporting themselves. But more than that is, according education according to the Indian tradition, is initiation to the life of spirit, a training of human soul in the pursuit of truth and the practice of virtue. All education is on one, on the one side a search for truth, on the other side it is pursuit of social betterment. Now, see, see go to, if in, within all these statements is hidden the point that only if we have good education, we can improve our society, we can improve our nation. Education should give the children not only intellectual stimulation, but a purpose. And, and that's what is very critical to understand today. Any satisfactory system of education should insist on both knowledge and wisdom, jnanam vijnana sahitam. It should not only train the intellect, but bring grace into the heart of men. And that's what we believe that higher education should not make us only proud of knowing it, but also make us uh, rooted to the ground to be humble, uh, so that we can bring, uh, you know, there's a great saying in, in uh, Sanskrit, Vidyati Dadati Vinyam, that more you get learned, more humble you become. And that's what we expect to happen. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, the aim of university education should be to turn out true servants of the people who will live and die for the country's freedom. Because this is, of course, in the context of the uh, India being subjugated and the British rule, that's where he suggests, but but country's freedom can be uh, interpreted in many, many ways, including progress and what we want to do and uh, what good we want to do. And when at Tagore, who founded Vishwabharati University and another Nobel laureate in literature, he said, the highest education is that which does not merely give us information, but makes our life in harmony with all existence. A, a great theoretical physicist, Oppenheimer, made another very uh, a remarkable comment that no man should escape our universities without knowing how little he knows. Now, this is something remarkable. Uh, people say, okay, when you get your highest degree, where's the question of how little one knows? But in reality, uh, they, when we know something, then only we know what we still do not know. And that's what it means, that without knowing how little he knows, because the world is, there's so much of knowledge all around which we still do not know. And, and that's what Oppenheimer was alluding to. 
Aurobindo again uh, had written enormously about education and some of the basic things that he has written are something that we need to remember. Three basic principles of education. Nothing can be taught. The teacher is not an instructor or taskmaster. He is helper and a guide. Now this is, I think, the crux of what we are supposed to be doing. We are helper and a guide. The mind has to be constructed in its own growth. The idea of hammering the child into the shape desired by the parent or the teacher is barbarous and ignorant superstitions. So this is where I think we, we our society goes wrong, that we want our children to be this or that or that, without wondering what their children is capable. And this is what Arvindo says, work from the near to the far, from that which is to what to that which shall be. That what that child is, let's look at what that child can do, how, how he or she can do, and, and that's where we need to uh, help and promote. And that's what uh, Arvinda says is the purpose of education. And that's what uh, uh, Socrates has also stated long back. One cannot teach anybody anything. One should make them think. But let them think what they are. And Albert Einstein again says, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Unfortunately, we do many a times these kinds of things. As parents, we want our child, child to be this or that, but the child is not interested, is not competent in that area, and that's what happened, that uh, they, they uh, suffer all of their life, and uh, with uh, sometimes disaster consequences as well. I again come back to Sir Radha Krishna because what he said about university, he set an example of integrity, efficiency, and applied behavior, and he said a university is essentially a corporation, of teachers and students, the kind of education that we provide for our youth is determined overwhelmingly by the kind of men and women we secure as teachers. And 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 you see, I can tell you, if BHU succeeded so much, was because in Malvijay's time, reduction time, the kind of people who were appointed as teachers were really outstanding, and that's what laid the foundation. And we continue to. Uh, work on the momentum started at that time. And this, this was an important point. The most valuable thing about a university is its atmosphere, something in its life that enters into character and influences everything in after years. I'm sure everybody was studying in a university and had good experience there. That those phase of life remains, comes back and back again and again in, in mind to think about what it was. And, and the staff and authorities of the university should set an example of integrity, efficiency, and applied behavior. Because then, and then only, we can attain the purpose for which universities are established, and uh, they, they can make their uh, contribution to the national building. Unless this happened, the last part, that universities set up an example of integrity, efficiency, and applied behavior, then only our next generation will learn this, and thereby contribute to the wellness of the country. A teacher, what it should be. Salvador Radha Krishna, again, a remarkable teacher. He stated, must be a committed man, committed to faith in the future of man, man in the future of man, and in the future of the country and the world. The profession of a teacher should not be reduced to a trade, to a calling, a vocation, and a mission. And then he wants one thing more to teachers or to students. When we think we know, we cease to learn. And the moment we cease to learn, I think we cease to be human beings. We cease to be good citizens. And so we need, must keep on learning all the time. Teachers are as a role model they, because they help in imbibing knowledge and show the path. And, and Arvindo said this, the first rule of moral training is to suggest and invite not command or impose. The best method of suggestion by personal example. Teachers have to be role models by their personal example. Albert Einstein stated, example isn't the isn't another way to teach, it is the only way to teach. Example of self, example of something that is important and uh, nice. Now about teacher and teaching methods, I, I, I really like this uh, comment by uh, philosopher Chesterton, there's a great deal of difference between the eager man who wants to read a book and the tired man who wants a book to read. You know, both mean same thing, but then the implications are different. And in context of the learning, I wonder 
do students and teachers endure or enjoy the interactions? If a teacher enjoys teaching, students enjoy learning. If, if the teacher endures teaching, something compulsion, okay, I have to do teaching and therefore I go to class and teach something. Students endure learning or students endure the teacher. What is enjoyed endures, but what is endured does not endure. Uh, if you have to face something under compulsion, the impressions are not lasting. But if you enjoy something that you are looking at, the memory and the understanding really lasts. And therefore, in the art of teaching, a teacher should emulate an inspired musician who during a concert not only gets enthused and energized himself or herself, but has the same effect on the appreciative audience. I'm sure a musician, when deep in the performance, doesn't know what is around, just enjoying. And same thing happens with the audience. And same thing, similar thing should happen in a classroom where the teacher and students are enjoying the interaction rather than enduring. Arvind also said what a teacher should do, but implied also what a teacher should not do. Most teachers want to have good students, students who are studious and attentive. And this is what they say, this spoils everything. The students begin to consult books, to study, to learn. Then they rely only on books, on what others say or write. Now, this is where comes the problem. Even our ancient scriptures talk about that the book knowledge should be tertiary or quaternary. The more important parts of knowledge are ex observations, experience, and analysis. And But this is what is spoiled when we when teachers insist on good students who, who get good marks, then, then they only uh, remain restricted to the textbook knowledge, and that's not enough. The, essentially, the only thing teachers should do assiduously is to teach them to know themselves and to, to their destiny, the path they will follow, to teach them to look at themselves, understand themselves, and to what they want to be. And this is particularly important when we come to the higher education because in the young state, the child is not that uh, clear as to what they can be. But by the time they come to college and universities, at that time, they are, they are mentally mature, emotionally mature, and they can decide, they can understand themselves, they can analyze themselves. And this is the teachers have to help them. To love to learn is the most precious gift that one can make to a child to learn always and everywhere. And this is what I think as teachers we need to uh, give this thing to the, our students that they begin to learn, they enjoy learning rather than endure learning. And learning generates curiosity and teaching process must therefore catalyze more questions in minds of learners, progress depends on curiosity driven questions new knowledge lets us know what we still do not know this is what uh, was stated earlier also that only when you know something we know what we do, still do not know and that's what leads to uh, what we call as research learning never stops a teacher must always remain a student and this is what albert einstein has stated in a very satirical way education what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned in school because if that learning is not memory you forget but something that you imbibe out of it, filter out of it, that's what your education is. And that's what will uh, continue with our life. Then the next question that universities, we want that they should undertake research. Why should we undertake research? Firstly, curiosity, which is, uh, uh, as we all know, uh, that human mind is curious every time. And I think the maximum curiosity that one can experience and one can see is the young toddler who is absolutely curious you can't stop that toddler from touching exploring and uh, feeling everything that's curiosity and i think a researcher should have that kind of curiosity to be anxious to learn everything and and so on the next thing we do career research particularly in today's time in research in universities is career prospects because we will not get promoted we will not get appointed and so on and so forth and therefore we undertake some research and the third, the most disturbing part is we have nothing else to do. I passed MSc, what do I do? No job, or I join research. Or I finished PhD, nothing. What to do? Join somewhere, postdoc, and so on and so forth. Now, this is, they also do research, but then uh, the contribution wise, curiosity driven is the best part of 
nature of research. Because research is a vocation, it's not a job, and, and we must take it as a vocation. Teaching and research are complementary in, in the university system. Very often there is a talk that why should uh, universities have places of teaching and learning, why should we insist on research? We must understand this, that university is a place of higher learning in diverse disciplines, but learning is based on existing as well as the new knowledge that, that is created through research by us or by others. Since university is not only disseminate knowledge, but also create new knowledge, the university teacher is expected to engage in research activity in addition to his her teaching responsibility. And this is where comes a very important contribution that universities do to nation building. Because of research, they generate new knowledge. That new knowledge becomes useful to many others, basic knowledge, increases knowledge, but then that basic knowledge is converted to applied and industry and so on. And this is where the importance of universities and national building comes in. Research is, is a continuing activity. It is successful only when the answer generated in response to one question generate many more questions. And this is what we must remember, that no research comes to a stop. A research project may come to a stop, but that research project is successful only when it has generated more questions, which the researcher is keen to continue to pursue further. And that's what uh, Einstein also stated, education, not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. Creation of, of a good academic ambience at higher education institutions ensures quality education and keeps faculty and students excited and curious. This initiative catalyzes high quality research and innovation, and which in turn leads to nation's progress, humanity's progress. Bertrand Russell said, men are born ignorant, but not stupid. And, and he made a very uh, important satirical uh, comment. They are made stupid by education. Now, this, this may sound very uh, funny that why should we, we talk of education providing so much? Why are they made stupid? It's because of the way we teach uh, in the classroom, the way we handle our students. Uh, all the wrong things that uh, were stated not to be done, we continue to practice. And that's where this becomes that they are made stupid by education. And our education system in, in India is really not in very healthy state. Why? But what are the factors? There can be numerous factors, but some important ones, philosophical ones that I have noted here are a major factor responsible for the poor quality of education in various disciplines, with the continuing erosion of ethical values in society in general and in education, particularly. You see, we have always thought every society, and particularly in Indian society, teachers were considered to be the highest in pedestal uh, of uh, social hierarchy. But today it is not. And because teachers are no more respected and because there is a general ethical decline in the society as a whole, teaching profession has only left out. And the result is that our students, our next generation, young ones, suffer in the process. And they're taking teachers as a role model. They learn what they do and, and the vicious circle continues. Then the other thing is unhealthy competition due to ever increasing population, more population, more competition, and the lure of quick material gains have tarnished the conventional image of educators as role models who work not only for self-satisfaction, but more for general benefits to the society. A teacher teaches primarily because of self-satisfaction, but at the same time, because one feels that this is beneficial to, to the society, but this philosophy is getting uh, shrunk greater and greater as we begin to look at material gains as more important. And so how we can improve this? There can be multiple ways, numerous ways, no simple way uh, exists. But something that can be, we can try is proactively promote quality education and research in colleges and universities to improve facilities and environment. Now, there are two components in this. Facilities is material facilities, but equally important is the environment. Are we providing conducive environment where they can think or they, or they, or they spend their time in uh, meaningless activities that bureaucracy keeps on demanding of us every time, reports and whatever it is, uh, that, that we spend more than 50% of our time in non-academic activities. Can you not change that? If you can change that, we can make use of our time in a much better constructive manner for which we are here. And then in research, we need to aim for profound discoveries and innovations. 
we demand more common sense, not just high high state art, but you, you see, uh, and th this is where we remember Sivi Raman, whose uh, discovery we are celebrating today. It was more of a common sense. I mean, his discovery that why C is green, his question led him to discover the uh, Raman effect, and that's what won a Nobel Prize. But that was a more of a common sense that he began to ask these questions, and with, and without state of the art facilities, he went on to win a Nobel Prize. Why are we not able to do it today? Let's ask ourselves. Partly because we are more and more becoming slaves of the state of the art facilities, rather than our common sense and curiosity and questioning attitude and perseverance. And of course, we need more transdisciplinary approach, which is again missing in most of our universities because. Our universities, although the name is university, but each department is a completely isolated, insulated from a neighboring department. And with that kind of a border that we create, we begin to lose a comprehensive, a universal understanding of phenomena. And we need a transdisciplinary approach. I think the more we do of this, we improve our facility, we improve our environment, and uh, we take multidisciplinary Really multidisciplinary, not just that two people of different disciplines come together and say we'll ask a question. They must understand what that question is and why why they need to be there, what complementary expertise they have. When that is done, then it becomes meaningful. What we need is the students. It's both ways. As a biologist, I know that in, in, in any biological process, it's self to self communication or self differentiation or development requires competence of the, on the part of the cells, part of the tissue, and a signal coming from outside. So in, in our teaching profession, teachers may be the one who give the signal, but students are the one who receive the signal. If they are not competent to receive, uh, receive the signal, the classroom is meaningless. And this is what we need to do. We need competent mentor and deserving students. We need adequate infrastructure so that their time and their uh, efforts are fruitful. And we need conducive environment and governance. Now, both things, we are on the negative side. And I think we need to improve that for the university to really become critical in national development. Unfortunately, as the things are, we are not really positive about whether we are creating that kind of situation. But this is what we need to do. Our objective university, I'll come to my con uh, conclusion part. What I think objective should be is what Madan Mohan Malviya proposed in 1905. There, when, when he proposed Banat, the creation of uh, the Banat University, and this is what he predicted. Therefore, practical building of youth will be a major goal of the proposed university. Higher education will not only produce ingenious, doctors, legalists, scientists, scholars, and scholars, but such people will be created whose character is bright, who is beautiful and valued. This university, which is what we talk about the, when we propose the Banaras University, will be, of, will be a nursery of qualified citizens and not just an institution giving degrees by certifying the level of knowledge acquired. And I think this is the most critical part that we need to create citizens who really build up the university. The, the three great people, they all have been associated with uh, we achieved one way or the other. He was, of course, the founder. He was the vice chancellor after uh, production after Ma, uh, Malviji. And Mahatma Gandhi came at the inauguration of the HU when the, when the foundation was being laid in uh, 1916. And it's important to remember historically. And that time he had not become Mahatma. He was just Mohan Chan, Mohan, uh, Chan Gandhi. But he came. And he spoke bluntly to the entire gathering, accumulated their Rajas, Maharajas, and all that. But he didn't mind uh, mince his words in telling what should be done. And, and this is where I think he has contributed to the national building because of his uh, remarkable plain truth and convictions. But these three people really shaped what BHU is and, and what it could be. So in the coming to the last part, I will say that country's enormous youth or is awaiting good and holistic education. Teacher must be their friend, philosopher, and guide. Then only we serve the purpose of university, and then only universities can serve the nation in its uh, forward movement. So with that, I thank you all for the attention and, and the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, sir, uh, for uh, uh, 
recollecting the history and uh, uh, highlighting the significance of uh, teacher student role in nation building and uh, with the permission from vice chancellor uh, if there are any questions or with permission from professor lakotia uh, i'm uh, happy if there are questions to answer. Okay, sir. If there are any questions please uh, professor lakotia would you would you want to comment on national education policy that is going to uh, start uh, in the next academic session okay you you want me to comment <laughs> because that can be very very long comment but but in short i will just say it is very ambitious it has many good points uh, particularly about the uh, distribution of students in vocational and educational courses the opportunities for vocational training and so on these are some some something that i realized because if you recall way back in 19 uh, uh 2006 and 7 and 8 academies had discussed this and suggested that uh, after school or during school and but more more than that after school there should be a distinct distinction between vocational and educational training i'm glad that this is what part of the new education policy i'm also glad that they are thinking of the uh, bs uh, four year degree course so that you can learn better. These are some positive sides. The MCT side, I'm not sure whether doing it with UGC and creating a new superstructure will really be helpful because ultimately what is important is UGC has great objectives, has great structures, but it's the implementation where Indians are known to go wrong and we have been going wrong and I'm not sure whether they'll be doing it better now. But equally important is on these grand plans, where is the money? Has money been allocated in the budgets? We don't see that. And therefore, putting everything in private hands, I'm not sure. I, I, I have my own worries about privatization of education because I have always believed and I've written about it that education, health, these things have to be social responsibility, societal responsibility, societal responsibility. They can be private private public partnership or but more important that the government society and because when we say government we mean society the government gets money from society only and that money has to come back to take care of their education to take care of their health leaving it in name of private who, who become yes we have some great private universities in india which are doing very well where from the philanthropic point of view but i don't know if any of them matches what tata's philanthropy was I think we need that kind of philanthropy. You know, when the Institute of Science was established, from day one, Tata didn't have any control over it, except their one representative sitting on the council of ISC. And, and that's what philanthropy has to be. Not that I contribute something and therefore I keep, keep controlling it, which unfortunately most private universities do. That should be avoided. A university is a university, it should be run in the spirit of, of a public institution which unfortunately the new education policy is not very clear about starting right from school and that's where my worries are okay thank you thank you dr madhu are... has a question go ahead madhu uh somebody is asking something yeah dr madhu would like yeah madhu you are on uh, mute i'm sorry uh good afternoon professor lakutia uh this is madhu babu yeah uh, <clears throat> Uh, thank you for a nice insight onto the role of universities in national building today. And uh, <clears throat> I have a specific question because you mentioned about efficient governance and all in your talk in the university system. How do you think, uh, now, now that we have different levels of autonomy in the university system, how do you think universities should use their autonomy considering the, uh, you know, uh, all universities are on a spectrum of development, like some are very advanced, some are just started. So how do you think when it comes to governance, uh, implementation of UGC norms or standards should be uh, taken? I mean, like what should be the trade-off? Because for an advanced university, which is an advanced stage, taking certain, uh, uh, if we implement UGC norms as it is, uh, it would, it won't be really justified to a uh, with the, <clears throat> to the common sense and if we use common sense some things are really not justified uh, yes. so how do you think uh, uh, people who are governing the universities should make a trade-off where they say 
uh, this makes sense we will adopt this this doesn't make sense we don't adopt this well i uh, should they really use their autonomy yes yeah, yeah, this, this is again a very complicated issue but two things i would like to say is autonomy comes with accountability and responsibility that's the first important point but another serious concern that i really have is are we really getting more autonomy i think there is a greater micromanagement every 3 months you have to give a report every 3 months you have to give financial report academic report you spend more more and more time you can't do this with this money you can't do this you can't do that so that autonomy which is in and, and this is one of my worry about the nep and if you on one hand talks about autonomy but at the same time in the governance we are getting more and more micromanagement governance which is something to worry but presuming that micromanagement is not there or somewhere somebody does it in the governance part again the rules that have been made by ugc unfortunately when you talk to ugc officials they will say okay these are the academic people who make these rules so we get into a vicious circle we have not the best kind of academics people sitting on the on those committees there always then there are other vested interests there are guidelines there are uh, instructions from uh, direct or indirect from the government uh, that, that is in power and certain policies are made now so these policies i know they have been really damaging like the pol policy about certain minimum number of research publications certain number of this uh, quantified things which is what led to what we now see as the predatory journals predatory conferences and uh, predatory awards also now so you pay money and you get an award yes sir so so, so these are these are something what what as academicians we need to learn is that we need to worry more about quality than quantity and i think this is where the governance also has to understand how to assess quality rather than quantity and but but it's easy said than done but there are certain ways that yes one can get the quality part of it rather than simply going by impact factor number of awards number of publications and so on and so forth these are in my mind they are wrong and actually this is what uh, through the science academy we uh, issued a, uh, created a set of guidelines which funding agency said they agreed but then again the governance part is something uh, they, they should not be asking for impact factor of journals because all the funding agency dbt dst scrb they are signatory to the dora declaration but look at the performance that these agencies give you are required to be impact factor why now this is where the governance issue comes in and and that's what needs a good governance part yes sir thank you sir uh, there is one question uh, in the text box sir uh, from uh, yes. sc uh, i'll read the question for you yeah. with the online classes and lesser practicals how can the student current student community equip themselves for futuristic thinking if the present line of thought is vague in direction i'm sorry i, I couldn't get the question properly okay. so let me see if i, I mean, can uh, check box see yeah, wants you to less of practical yeah this, this is this is a serious problem particularly you see uh, in subject that do not require practicals online classes can to some extent help although i'm not convinced that online classes can really uh, supplement uh, or, or complement a real class they they cannot replace it they can only add something more they can complement it but the absence of classroom practical experience in science subjects is, is a disastrous situation and this is something we will have to really work out how do we train our students as it is our worry is that even in normal uh, course of events our laboratories are becoming less and less occupied by students productively occupied and most masters or bachelor degree holders have not really done much of the lab work and and this is something that we 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 have to worry about and this is something that uh, supervisors for phd students we worry about that they do not know this or do not know that and and we we need to take responsibility as teachers in classroom did we really make them learn did we really make them think about these things and online classes this is a real problem and this is going to be something that will face in coming coming uh, few years and decades that we'll have to think about it
there is a comment from Professor Ranganath, sir. So he says, well, higher education. I, yeah. I see a question if it's 8,000 per month. I agree. This is shameful. And I think universities need to find some money, some way. Government needs to find it some ways. That they should give a decent fellowship. But then at the same time, I, I should also qualify. Everybody is now, does everybody need to do join PhD? That's another question. You see, again, going back to what was Arvinda's statement, we need to see who can do what. Are we filtering that? So now in the rush, because they have nothing else, so they join PhD and because they get money. Now, we, we, we need to filter out, we need to balance this. But then a genuine PhD student, 8,000 is certainly an insulting amount. I, I, I'm very clear about it. It has to increase. You either you reduce intake, give more money to students, or uh, find out some somewhere else. But just to say, okay, we give you something and do this, we cannot. It, it, it cannot really justify. Sir, I have one question, sir. But, but then uh, I must add to this. See, if you are really sincere, again, going back to C.V. Raman, he was not earning anything for his, for his research. He was a, 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 in an administrative service in British government. He did his research on his own money. So it's not always the money that, in, uh, that makes you interested in doing something. It's your own interest. Even with 8,000, uh, even though I may agree that this is insulting, but if one is serious, one can do what? Uh, uh, there are many people who live with much less money. But still, money should not be the major con consideration for deciding whether we do good research or do, do bad research. If we do research, it has to be good, not something uh, compromising. Okay, university fellowship I have already answered. Then there is uh, Dr. Seema Mishra asking, uh, listen, your contribution towards betterment of students in terms of ethical, moral. Well, that's uh, we. If, if we are ethical, we talk it ethically, we teach them ethically because as teachers, we are role models and students will pick it up consciously, unconsciously. And also now that UGC had made their the ethics course a compulsory part, I think the teachers need to really get that thing done so the students are also conscious of what is ethical and what is non-ethical. Okay, job opportunities I can't say because that again depends on the total way, how do we make use of it, how our uh, employment possibilities are and the opportunities are. Um, on one hand, I know there are so many positions lying vacant in the university college systems in the country. But why they are not being filled up and or why they are being filled up wrongly, I can't make a comment on this. But we know that things are not really what they should be. And that's unfortunate. Sir, I have one question. Yes. And uh, see, there is something called adaptation. We believe in the, in the biology. Yes. So is that the adaptation imbalance somewhere? That's why we have got... Uh, mushrooms of private universities and then education that it is changing the education system in India and we, you know, I don't know maybe you can comment on that I'm sorry I couldn't get the question very clearly adaptive immunity is there one part but no, then how does it see adaptation is what we naturally adopt to certain things yes, yes. so now even though for example somebody gets admission from uh, University of Hyderabad or BHU, they may think twice, rather would like to join in some private university where entire course is run in one small room. So, well, you see, it, the, the part of the problem is because there are too many numbers. So okay, everybody, so. even who is competent, cannot get into a place. Uh, and because of the money, because of other influences, because of rot learning, even our interests are not really the best way of judging the student's capacity. So we do get people who are not worthy getting into an admission. Somebody who is worthy cannot get in because there are other factors like reservations and so on and so forth. And so therefore they join some place and they think ultimately it's a degree which is important. So this is our human nature that we, partly you can call it adaptation, a kind of negative adaptation, because in evolution things go retrograde, things go forward. And same thing happens with human nature. 
you may go forward and sometimes with compassion you may go backward and and that does happen in a social situation sir uh, can i ask one question sir yeah sure sir yes. sure sir thank you so much sir for your lecture my question is sir how do you understand the relationship between uh, science and technology education on the one hand and vocational education on the other hand sir because the ndp 2020 is uh, celebrating the importance of uh, vocational education they're saying that we have to start the vocational education courses from school to university level so but uh, most of the universities are very much indifferent to the idea of vocational education so given the the idea of national building and where we are supposed to train the students both for the skills as well as the knowledge production of knowledge where do you look at the role of university especially the practice of science sir? well uh, see i i personally think that vocational training by itself is not the mandate of universities there should be separate institutions that train them in specific trade uh, art that that train them to get a, a, a job where for their services that they can provide expertise that they can develop uh, universities are more to do with basic education yes but our basic education should also be something relevant so that they their their knowledge can be gained see what what where we have gone wrong is a social structure that a bachelor degree is a must for everybody either for marriage or for service or for even social standing somebody who doesn't have bachelor degree we say okay is no good that this is socially something wrong that we have gone on but then if we say they're all right by doing a bsc you 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 become a plumber because we give you that training now one doesn't need to to have bachelor degree in science that that can be simply as some other training good training uh, good old days i'm sure as as sir, those who were older age remember that the plumbers or the electricians like the 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 who who used to do the job so carefully didn't have any degrees or for example if you look at the ancient buildings in india or abroad they didn't have uh, they, they were not architectural engineers uh, trained in iits or engineering colleges it was more by training so that vocational training need not be linked to universities i think what is happening now in theme of this is we are diluting our basic standard and in 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 my opinion we will be neither here nor there i think we we we, we should make that very clearly distinct thank you sir thank you so much there is one question sir maybe yes arish puri ha uh, position of india in coming 10 years is that the question Yes, yes. <laughs> It's very difficult to say. See, with everybody running to get into 500, I do not know how can everybody be included in 500 unless you make each each hundred into five. <laughs> so, but but to me, this kind of ranking is wrong. University ranking is as wrong as the impact factor of a journal. That's that's why my my feeling is because these impact these rankings are based more on quantitative parameters, which are commercially driven. what we need to really look at is what our students are doing how successful they have been that should be a more important contribution to the society to the nation when uh, just think so if we keep on training well our students india has a remarkable uh, opportunity to really be a, a leader not just leader in science and technology but but a philosophical leader as well but but that depends on how well we train our young generation and in what direction you train them or rather you put them more into materialistic views that is not going to lead us to maybe it can give us some more money but not really that kind of leadership that uh, we expect india to take if uh, there are no more questions i request professor santosh uh, deputy dean uh, students welfare to propose word of thanks Uh, good afternoon everyone uh, first of all i would like to express my sincere gratitude to professor uh, subhas chandra lakotia for accepting our uh, invitation in very short time and uh, delivering this excellent talk on the role of universities in nation building sir we are enlightened with your uh, extreme knowledge and experience what you have shared with us on behalf of uh, dsw and nss i sincerely thank you for your time and patience thank you very much sir for your valuable uh, talk and the other side uh, i would like to express my sincere gratitude to our honorable vice chancellor in spite of his busy schedule he spent uh, the valuable time with us 
and uh, shared his views on the in this occasion the national science day and uh, other part of our dsw professor nagaraj garu and uh, dr bindu madhavreddy all the faculty colleagues who have attended in a very short notice we have given and uh, i would like to express my all sincere thanks to each and every one who helped to organize this event successfully thank you one and all thank you very much. thank you namaste thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you sir thank you. I think uh, our vice chancellor cancelled his program and attended this. He said he is very busy. All right, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I I know my priorities. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.